Congregational singing sounded very good this morning. I like to hear good singing. I think it prepares our hearts for the message and gets us in the right mindset. Gets our heart ready for the preaching of the Word of God. 
If you have your Bible this morning, want to read with us, turn to the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and <clears throat> we trust that you'll pray for us for just a few minutes. We'll try not to keep you very long this morning, try to just keep you as long as God would have us to keep you. When outside this morning, I thought that if we had been able to think and know ahead of time enough, it'd been a good Sunday to have service outside, wouldn't it? Boy, it's a beautiful day. Thank God for the beautiful weather that we've had. And it's all in his hands anyway. And we'd say, well, preacher, you shouldn't have service out. Well, there'd be nothing wrong with having service outside in God's, in God's sanctuary. But I'm thankful for the good church house that we're able to meet in this morning. And, and I'm thankful for all of you being here. Second Thessalonians chapter number 2. Uh, I don't know that we'll be able to get through the entire chapter today. Uh, we're going to read just a few verses in your hearing, and then we'll try to leave with you what God's laid on our heart. And beginning in verse number 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with, yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, that, that's correctly read. That's verses 1 through 12 in Second Thessalonians chapter number 2. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Brother Anthony Tatum, will you lead us to the Lord in prayer?
appreciate that message, that prayer, and I appreciate uh, you praying, and I trust that you're going to continue to pray this morning. I'm going to step over into some things today and preach on some things that I'd rather not. I'm going to deal with some things I'd rather not have to deal with and talk about things that I'd rather not have to look at. But it's the time in which we're living, and I, I believe this morning, and I'm I, I, I really do. I believe the Lord laid on our heart and burdened us with the thought of preaching through First and Second Thessalonians. And we're almost finished. And I, and I know that you may think, well, preaching, we don't need that. That's more teaching than preaching. But I, I believe it's good preaching. I believe it's good pastoring. I believe it's good for the church to go through some things and uh, uh, let the pastor preach and let the pastor teach and let the pastor guide and let the... Sunday school teachers and the Wednesday night teachers go through some things and see the full and complete picture of them. I believe that that's necessary in the day in which we're living. And that being said, there's some things we're going to deal with this morning. Uh, if you wait off in them, you're going to say, Preacher, that's mighty deep. And it might be deep in the Word of God. But it's all right. It's time that we moved on from the milk of the Word unto the meat of the Word at times. And... There'll be something in here this morning for every age group and every person that's here if it's from uh, God, and I hope that it is. I hope God puts a gate upon my mouth and doesn't allow me to say anything that he doesn't want us to say and doesn't uh, let me interject my ideas but preach the word of God this morning. And the Bible says when we come down through here and we look at this verse by verse and that's going to take us a little while. So you get comfortable, keep your Bibles out, okay? You got the best benches you've ever sat on, amen? Thank God for that. Hallelujah. And I don't think this is a two-hour message. It's more like a two-week message uh, every hour of the day, but we're going to do our best to get it out just, just as quick as we can. Thank, thank God this morning for His Word. Now, the Bible says, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our, by our gathering together, unto him. So now I'm going to remind you of some things that I've been talking about and I've said several times and I want to recap. I've preached to you and we've talked about the rapture of the church and we've talked about uh, we've talked about the revelation of Jesus Christ. We've talked about the tribulation period. We've talked about the time in which we're living right now and I hope when you walk out of those doors this morning you got a good order of the way that the Bible tells us things are going to occur. And I hope you know where you're at in the plan of God. And I hope you know this morning, most of all, that you're saved beyond a shadow of a doubt. Because if you're not saved this morning, there's some things that are going to happen uh, in the future that ought to frighten you. Ought to scare you. And ought to shake you into making sure this morning that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. And so... This morning we have referred to several times in our preaching on 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. We've referred to this phrase, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. And we said that the day of Christ is a time of blessing and rejoicing. The day of Christ commences, that means begin. All right, I learned a big word this week. I'm going to use it on you. All right, expand my vocabulary. It commences with the rapture of the church. That's our blessed hope. Amen. If you aren't looking for the blessed hope this morning, the rapture of the church, get your eyes off the things of the world and get them on the things of God because the rapture of the church, us gathering together to be with the Lord in the air and be with Him forever, is the greatest thing that we've got going for us. And the Bible says it'll purify us. The Bible says He that had this hope in Him purifieth Himself. In other words, if we've got a hope looking for the rapture of the church, it'll make us try to live right. Amen. Why do we need to try to live? Because we've got a witness and the thing that we've got to witness to a lost and dying world. And he says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So that ought to clarify for us what he's talking about. If he's coming and we're being gathered, he's talking about the rapture. He's talking about when the Lord appears in the sky, in the clouds, and we're called up as we uh, uh, preached in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to be called up together with him in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
And then he says in verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. So now let me, let me tell you something right here. And if you've got a study Bible, I don't care uh, uh, what kind of study Bible. I, I care that you got a King James Bible. I want you to have a King James Bible. But if you've got a study Bible, it may interject something right there and it may call this the day of the Lord it may say that this is the day of the Lord but I believe what the King James Bible says not what man says in his study Bible notes okay all right that's all right it's okay I've got commentaries on the, the book of first Thessalonians and every one of them say and say uh, all of them but one say that the King James Bible is mistranslated I don't believe that brother Ronnie I believe it said I believe it's right Amen. Because he talks about, he's already settled for us. And he says in verse 1, and I just shared this with you. The coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him. So he's coming in the clouds, we're gathering up to him. That is the day of Christ. That's what is going to set us up for the great things that are going to happen for us in glory. When we're at home with the Lord and we're presented unto God the Father as the chaste virgin, the bride of Christ, and we go through the uh, we go through the uh, judgment seat of Christ I preached on last week, and we go into the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's our blessed hope is being with Christ. Hallelujah. And Paul says, I don't want you to be shaken. Now he's writing to a church. We've already referred to this many, 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 many times, and I hope you've got this in your head. He, he's writing these epistles to a church that he was at three or four weeks. He taught and he preached to them out of the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, chapter 16 and 17. The Bible says three Sabbaths. So he was there about three or four weeks. He wasn't there long, and they run him out of town. Uh, and listen, they and he left, and he goes, and he preaches in other, uh, and he preaches in another community, and some come from Thessalonica and run him out of that town. They didn't like him, or there were a lot there that didn't like him. But he's writing back to those people that believed and accepted and heard the word of God and received the word of God. And so those people that believed and accepted and heard and received the word of God had gotten word and they had gotten scared because somebody had come in with some doctrine and told them, you've missed the rapture. You've missed the resurrection. And that's what Paul's writing here. Now, Paul says, look this. Now, look at this word by word. He says, I don't want you. He says, be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. So evidently somebody had written a letter to the church at Thessalonica and put Paul's name on it and said, you've missed the rapture. You've missed the resurrection. Evidently somebody was teaching some false doctrine and Paul says, I don't want you to be shaken. He tells them in verse number five, he says, remember you not that when I was with you yet, I told you these things. He says, you remember what I preached when I was in your presence. You remember what I taught you when I was there with you. That the day of Christ is coming and you'll know it and you won't miss it. If you've been saved. He tells them this. In verse number 17 of chapter 3. Paul gives them a sign of every epistle that he writes. He says, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Now, what was he saying right there? Well, you can find these same words in, uh, you can find similar words uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 16, verse number 21, and what Paul is saying. Now, we know that the apostle Paul, I'm just going to take a little, I'm going to step off into a rabbit hole here, but I'm going to come back real quick, okay? The apostle Paul had bad eyesight, we believe. From what we've been taught and what history tells us that the Apostle Paul usually had somebody write things down as he dictated to them what to write. Okay? But Paul says, when I do that, I put a salutation in mine own hand. He says, you'll know it's mine by my handwriting. He said, I'm going to sign it at the end. You'll know it's mine if I write it and you don't have to be mistaken. Okay? Step back out of that rabbit hole. So Paul says... Uh, Paul says, not be soon shaken neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us that the day of Christ, as that the day of Christ 
is at hand. In other words, Paul is going to ta- Paul has gotten word back from the Thessalonians. He's in Athens writing back to them. He's gotten word that they are afraid that they have missed the rapture. They're afraid that they've missed the blessing of God in the day of Christ. They're afraid that things have happened and the resurrection is already past. Turn with me real quick to the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Keep your Bible out. Keep it open. Keep it uh, flexible so you can see what's going on. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Verse number 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Now, I'm not telling you that these two men, Hymenius and Philetus, are the two that misled the church at Thessalonica. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying this, that the Apostle Paul was already aware that there was false teaching and false doctrine going on. And he is writing back and saying there are some that we're acquainted with that are teaching that the resurrection is past. I want to tell you something this morning. I want to tell you something this morning. You ain't missed the resurrection. I don't care how bad the world looks, okay? How do I know that all that's going on around us is not the, is not, somebody said what? And listen, I, I'm going to step over. I'm, I'm probably going to get some of you mad. And I don't want to make anybody mad. I'm not trying to make anybody mad. But people, when the, when the vaccine came out, they said, Oh, my Lord, this is, the, this is the mark of the beast. Lord, it ain't the mark of the beast. I'm telling you, that's coming way down the road. If you're saved, you ain't going to know it. All right? All right, let me just say that. All right, so Paul is teaching them, and Paul is about to do some reminding of them. Because they were worried that the resurrection had passed. They'd worried that they'd missed the day of Christ. They were worried. Uh, listen, and they were frightened and they'd been deceived. And then he says in verse number three, let no man deceive you by any means. In verse number, in verse number 10, he says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. I've got, I want you to understand something, that Satan wants to deceive the child of God. The world's already deceived, okay? He's wanting to deceive, the, deceive Christians. You turn to the book of Matthew, chapter number 24. You don't have to turn there, but you go home and read it this afternoon. Matthew, chapter 24. I've said this already. I've mentioned this many times. But the, but the, uh, but the apostles or the disciples came to Jesus. They asked him three questions. They asked Jesus, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And before Jesus answered any of their questions, he said, Take heed that no man deceive you. It's a time of deception. We're living in a great time of deception right now. And I'm going to show you where we're at. Okay? From the Word of God. And I want you to take the Word of God and I want you to believe the Word of God. And I want you to love the Word of God. I've told you that we're going to have to, we're going to, have to anchor our souls in this book, in this Word of God. We're going to have to know what it says and believe it. Amen. Amen. Now, a lot of people know what the Bible says, but they don't believe it. You've got to know it and believe it. Okay? Or it's not going to help you. All right. Y'all ready? <clears throat> Preacher used to say, buckle your seatbelt, Okay? All right, let no man deceive you, for that day shall not come. What day? What day is he talking about? The day of Christ. What's the day of Christ? That's the rapture of the church. Remember, I've given you this visual. Over here's the cross. We come all the way up. This little section right here is the seven-year tribulation. Somewhere before the tribulation happens is the rapture of the church. We're going to say it's the water glass right here, okay? This is where we're going to be caught up to the Lord in the air. He's coming back in the clouds. We're going to join him in the air. And and that's the day of Christ. The day of Christ commences. It begins our reward, our celebration. Praise God. The blessed hope of the church uh, begins with the rapture. And we're going home to be with him. Thank God. But Paul says that day shall not come except there come a falling away First, 
All right. Y'all ready? Book of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 4 through 14, gives us characteristics and signs, talks about wars and rumors of wars, talks about earthquakes in diverse places, and boy, we like to take all those things, and we like to say, and preachers like to do this, and I like to do it, we say, when all these things intensify, that we know the end is near. But those are signs and times that go all the way up into the midpoint of the tribulation period. Brother Jack, the only thing that the Word of God tells us for sure is going to happen before the rapture of the church, before the day of Christ comes, is an apostasy in the church, a falling away. The only thing that the Lord says we'll know for sure that we're in the last day is the, or that we're in the time before the, uh, before the rapture of the church, but the time before the day of Christ. The only way we're going to know that is an apostasy will start taking place. The word apostasia in the Greek is translated right there, falling away. It's where we get the word apostasy. The only thing that the Bible tells us will happen is this falling away. Now I've got a question for you. Are we in a time of falling away? Do we know? Let me say this before I get too far. You do know and realize that when he's talking about a falling away, he's not talking about the world. He is talking about people that profess to be Christians. He's talking about people that profess with their mouth to follow Jesus Christ. And I told you several years ago, I told you several years ago, listen to me, I told you several years ago about a pastor, about a pastor in California in a mainstream Protestant denomination who stood before him and, and who is a professed atheist Christian. Said he believes in the doctrines and teachings of Christ but does not believe there's a God. Now that's apostasy. Did you know that? That's apostasy. But I can take you from the left coast of the United States. I can put you in an airplane. I can fly you and I can parachute you out into a church in North Georgia where their pastor allegedly a few weeks ago, maybe it's been a few months ago, said that we, uh, he, he's made the statement, he said, I do not say the word of God says anymore. He says, I'm not going to say anymore that the Word of God says. He says, because the Bible is, the Bible, uh, uh, listen, uh, the Bible is confusing. The Bible is taking our focus and our emphasis off of the real problem. Uh, you probably got some of his books in your house. Some of you do. But he said, the Word of God, the Bible it's taking our attention. It is distracting us from the real problem. I got news for you. He's the problem. He's part of the problem. We've got apostasy in the pulpits. And you don't have to even, listen, if you've got a quarter tank of gas in your car, you can drive to his church this morning. You can go in and you can listen to what he says. And listen, I'm telling you, we are living in a time when men will not Listen, uh, in your sound doctrine, we're living in a time of apostasy. It's in the pulpits. The churches are falling away from Christ and the teaching of the Word of God. All right. Let me say some things about the day of Christ and the rapture, and then we're going to look on at this falling away. I want you to understand something. This day of Christ... This time when we're going to be caught up. And this time that Paul is writing about here. And telling them would not come. Listen, they were afraid they'd miss the day of Christ. But I want you to turn with the book of, uh, book of Philippians chapter number 1. Book of Philippians chapter 1. Verse number 6. Notice what the Bible says in Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing. That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until... The day of Jesus Christ. So I want you to be confident this morning. I want you to be assured of the fact that you have not yet arrived as a Christian. We have not gotten to the place in life where we uh, uh, don't have anything else to do or learn. We don't have any uh, day. We have not gotten to the place in life where we've quit growing as a Christian, growing in our faith, right? 
I preached last week on trying to grow in our faith. Chapter 1 talked about growing our faith. I want you to understand something. We ought to grow in faith every day. We ought to get closer to God every day. We ought to live closer to God every day because the Bible said He would perform that good work in us until the day of Christ. The children used to sing the song that the adults ought to have sung that says He's still working on me. Okay? He's still working on me. I'm glad today He's still working on me. I want him to keep working on me, don't you? I want him, yeah, preacher, I want him to work on you. I need you to be worked on. Yeah, I know you do. But I need the congregation to be worked on too, all right? Amen. Okay, that's a two-way street. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, or Philippians, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 1, verse number 10, the Bible says this, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ we remain faithful. Until the day of Christ. In other words, when some things come up that upset us. Maybe we hear something uh, and maybe we read something in the word of God that frightens us. We're not supposed to take offense to that. There are going to be some things that offend us. The truth will offend us if we've got visions or versions of, the, uh, of what we call that aren't the truth. Okay? But the word of God may be offensive, but we're not supposed to be. We're supposed to remain faithful. And you turn over into first, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 16. He says, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. No, I talked last week about, uh, well, I guess it was Wednesday, uh, Tuesday night at Bible College. I talked about uh, our rewards following us and talking about, uh, uh, being <clears throat> rewarded in the day of, of God and talking about, or, or in the day when God gives us our rewards. I talked a little bit about the judgment seat of Christ that we're heading to. And I want you to understand something. One of these days, we're going to be able to rejoice with those that we've helped along the way. There are going to be some that we've won to the Lord. And we're going to rejoice with them. But there are going to be some that we've helped grow in grace and grow in their faith. And we're going to get to re rejoice with them. Amen. Just like John testifies about the man uh, that told him to pray uh, for knowledge. That's helped Brother John. Who was it told you, John, to pray for knowledge and wisdom? He helped you. He's going to rejoice in glory one day with you. Amen. That's just a little bit of what's going to happen at the day. Of our Savior Jesus Christ. The day of Christ. And that day will not come. Except they're coming. They're coming falling away first. Alright. Turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. You've heard all this before. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Just maybe a page over in your Bible. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter times. Some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in, hypo in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now Paul is writing to Timothy. 1 Thessalonians is one of the very... 1 and 2 Thessalonians are the first writings of the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy is the last writing of the Apostle Paul. There's about a, 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 about a 15 year period of time where Paul writes there. Uh, and, I, and Paul is writing to the first Thessalonians. He wants, you to, uh, he wants you to be aware that there's going to come a fall in the way. And he's telling Timothy in chapter number 4. He's telling them again uh, uh, as he writes 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, you be careful. The Spirit speaketh uh, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. We're living in a time of departing from the faith. The Bible teaches us that people will depart from the faith. And I want you to know something that is not losing your salvation. That is people that have never been saved but made a mere profession. They said they were saved but there was nothing in their heart. There was no new birth that had taken place. And they have fallen away. Listen. I want to tell you something. Everybody look at me real close. The church at Thessalonica was going through persecution. And when persecution comes, if somebody is not 100% fully committed to a cause, they'll quit. Okay? 
If we're not fully committed to the cause of Christ, there's going to be some quit before this thing wraps up. There'll be, there'll be some that won't ever come back from the COVID virus, okay? Listen, you say, well, preacher, you shouldn't preach that. They're scared of the virus. They're not scared of the virus. That's their excuse. Amen. Amen. If they were scared of the virus, they would mail order everything and never walk out of their door. They'd never, they'd, they would just, they would live in a bubble. But they're interacting with everything else in the world. But church, but church, they've fallen away. Amen. They've been called out. Well, preacher, are they lost? I don't know. That's between them and God. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. They'd come a falling away. First Timothy chapter number six, verse 10. The Bible says this, for the, for the love of money. Well, that's not the right verse. Verse 21 is the one I wanted. Verse 21, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. And we can't err concerning the faith. What is going to keep us from erring concerning the faith? That thing that, bio, that thing that preacher said you didn't need that would be distracting from the real problem, the Word of God. The Word of God will keep you from erring in the faith. Did you know that? Well, preacher, I need to remember what you said last Sunday. No, you don't need to remember a thing I said. You need to remember what the Word of God said. What I said probably, uh, uh, listen, I probably stammered and stumbled through it and, and messed it up. But the Bible is clear and the Bible is real and the Bible is the truth. Listen, we look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3. This is familiar scripture, but I want, you to, I want you to get this. He says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Well, preacher, all that's referring to a different... Watch this, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Having a form of godliness. That is the falling away. People that have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God, which is through the preached word of God, which is uh, in uh, the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, Titus chapter number one, turn just another page or two. In your Bible, Titus chapter one, verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth unto the pure things that unto the pure all things are pure but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure but even their mind and conscience is defiled they profess that they know God but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate now that is the falling away that is where we're at in this time period we're living right now What's going to happen? What does the Bible say? The one thing the Bible says is going to happen before the day of Christ, the rapture of the church. He said that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. All right. I, I, I don't, I, I doubt y'all need any more examples. I doubt you need any more teaching to know and realize that we're in that falling away time. Now that pastor that I told you about that denied the word of God also several years ago said we don't need the Ten Commandments anymore. They're irrelevant now. And he said Christians don't need to worry about the Old Testament. Little by little the word of God's being destroyed in those believers or those people's minds. And what's become the final authority in their life is what that preacher says in the pulpit. That's their final authority now. What's my final authority? What's your final authority? What do we base all truth on? It better be on the Word of God. Well, I'm going to listen to what Congress says. We're well, going to listen to a lie. You better listen to what the Bible has to say. I'm talking about the final authority for life. Christ said, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We want to know the truth. We're going to have to know the Word of God. The Word of God. Uh, 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 John writes in John chapter number 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14 said, And the Word was made flesh, dwelt among us. 
So we have the Word of God. We have the inerrant, infallible, inspired, holy Word of God. And there's a lot of people today will tell you that since you do not hold the original piece of parchment that the Apostle Paul wrote on, called, and I'll give you this, this is something you might read in your study, they call that the autographs. They say that the, the original parchment that Paul and Peter and John pinned their words down on, call that the autographs. They'll say because you don't own, you do not hold in your hand the original autographs, that you don't hold the inspired word of God. It was inspired when it was written, but now it's not. Lamar Fine, or Ronnie Finally, uh, Amazing Grace in that song book. We're living in a time of falling away, and if people can get you to doubt the word of God, you can fall away. They can lead you astray. You can be deceived if you don't know the word of God. If you don't know the Bible, you can be deceived. And for us to know the Word of God, we're going to have to spend some time with the Word of God. All right. What page number is that, Ronnie? 479. All right, page 479 in your songbook is the song Amazing Grace penned by a man that we all know, John Newton. How many of you believe John Newton was inspired to write the song Amazing Grace? Anybody know about the life of John Newton? He was a slave trader, uh, a drunk. Listen but got saved out of that life? How many of you believe, really now, how many of you believe Amazing Grace was an inspired song? How many of you believe any song could be inspired? You believe God can move somebody's heart to pin something down that's going to be a blessing for generations later on? You believe John Newton was inspired to write the Word of God? Then how many of you are holding the original in your hand? See, we strain at gnats and swallow camels. We'll say John Newton's song is inspired, but then we'll deny the Word of God and say, well, I don't know if it's inspired or not. Lamar, we've lost our mind in the church and in the uh, professing Christendom, we've lost our mind. People will say, well, John Newton was inspired and that song Amazing Grace is inspired or I'll Fly Away is inspired or any other number of songs are inspired, but I don't know about 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians. Or first, ten, I don't know if they're inspired or not because they don't have the originals. Well, I've got them into something I didn't really know I was going to get into. Well, I want to tell you something. We've got to have the Word of God. If we're going to have the Word of God to know the truth, we're falling away. We're in a time of falling away. The only thing that can keep you from falling away is being anchored in the Word of God. Don't fall away from Christ. Don't fall away from the Word of God. Get anchored in the Word of God. Amen. And know what it has to say. You've got to know what the Bible has to say. You've got to be assured of what the Bible says is true. You've got to believe the Word of God. Or you're going to, you, you, you could be as those that are talked about in the Bible, Paul wrote about, carried about with every wind of doctrine. You see that preacher, and I'm not going to call his name, because there are others. He's just a prominent figure, prominent example. Huge campus, huge number of satellite churches. There are going to be thousands of people listening to his message this morning if he preaches. Thousands. He's going to write books and sell books. And I don't know if he's saved or not. That's between him and God. But I'm going to tell you something. Anybody tells you you don't need the Bible because it is distracting you from the real problem, he's the real problem. Amen? Because he likes to talk about social problems and social injustices and listen there's nothing wrong with trying to, to help the, the errors in our society there's nothing wrong with trying to do that there's nothing wrong with having an emphasis on feeding the hungry there's nothing wrong with that there's not a thing wrong with that but I'm telling you if we've gotten our eyes off Christ and we preach that a social gospel that you gotta help people listen you wanna help somebody get them saved they Amen. get their heart right with God there's no amount of reformation in the world that would help some people without being saved. Y'all heard Lyman. I love what Lyman, 
the story Brother Lyman told one time when he was still working at the county and worked over at the, was working at the, the dump there. And uh, some of the prisoners were working the dump. You know, they were working there. And, uh, some of them come up. And they were discussing church or whatever. One of them, group of them come up to Lyman. And everybody knows Lyman. A group of them come up to Lyman and they were talking about it. And one of them looked at Lyman and said, you know I'm saved. You's there. You's the one that saved me. Lyman looked at him and said, you look about like something I'd say. Amen. I tell you, people get saved by people. They end back up in the same mess they were in. You know that? I can't, listen, I can't help you apart from the Word of God. I can't help anybody apart from the Word of God. The church can't help anybody apart from the Word of God. We're falling away today because the church has lost the sight of the Word of God and the hope that is found in the Word of God. We're living in a time of falling away. We're living in a time when people think they can live any way they want to and be in the church house and it'll just be all right. If you took a survey this morning, if you took a survey of people that say they are Christians, and let's just talk about North Georgia. We're talking about, I could say Lumpkin County, but let's just open it up. Let's just say North Georgia, Northeast Georgia. This little, this little corner of the state we live in. If you took a survey of people that professed and said they were Christians, and you asked them, is it okay for a Christian to drink alcohol? And you said beer, wine, liquor, whatever, just alcohol. You said, is it okay for a Christian to drink alcohol? What you're going to find <laughs> is that the age group of people that are maybe 45 and older, the majority of them are going to say, no, no way. But that age group from about, from about 45 and younger, 40 and younger, 35 and younger, you ask them if it's okay to drink, and they'll say, why, sure, it's okay. Just don't get drunk. That's what they're going to say. Don't drive when you drink. You'll be okay. You say, well, preacher, do you know that for sure? I know that because I've seen it in church houses, amen. I've talked to people. I've seen people's pictures on Facebook that say they're a Christian and they got a beer in their hand, amen. That's a falling away. That's apostasy. They're shacked up living together thinking they can come in the church house and sing and play in the, people, uh, uh, sing in the choir and play music and they're living with people they're not married to. It can't happen. Listen, if it won't, if y'all want it at Mount Zion, just tell me now and I'll leave. All right? Because I'm not going to stand for it. And if you have to run me off because I've offended people, then run me off. But I'm not going. It's not going to happen while I'm at Mount Zion. Okay? Well, preacher, they won't come. That's fine. That's their choice. If they don't come, they won't hear the word of God. They're going to have to hear the word of God to get right. Why do people think this? Why do they have that in their mind? Because they've heard this social gospel. They've grown up in homes where people didn't have an emphasis on the word of God. They've grown up and they've gotten along with friends and their friends are going to these popular big churches or telling them they can live and do whatever they want. And listen, I can give you story after story and example after example. Uh, listen, uh, uh, people uh, uh, that, that, that lead, I've heard, testimony of people that went to church listen to her testimony of people that went to church on a Sunday night and went home from church on Sunday night to go have a big pot party with their friends because they thought it's all right but we're not hurting anybody it's just us getting together we're just having fun it's not it's not hurting anybody no it's destroyed you destroyed your testimony you're like the one Paul wrote about. You've got a conscience seared with a hot iron. You can't, you're not going to be reached with the truth of the gospel unless God shakes your very foundation and gets a hold of your heart in a way that he has never touched you before. Listen, I thought surely we'd get down to verse number 12. We ain't got past verse number 3. The falling away is, it is a sign. It is 
It is the time in which we're living right now. Prior to the rapture of the church. Have people been falling away for a long time? Yes, they were falling away in Paul's day. They were falling away in the, in the church's day of Thessalonica because they had erred in the faith. They had heard in something that had gotten them off of what Paul had said. But I want you to know something. It is in greater intensity today than it's ever been. It's a greater problem today than it's ever been. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And so now if you think we're in the falling away, if you think that we are in a time of a great falling away, if you think we're living in a time when the church, the professing, now listen to me. Let me, let me, let me make sure I, I've made myself clear on this. Those that are truly saved and born again are the true church of Christ. We're the true body of Christ. The Bible said that Christ told Peter that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. We're not going to, if we've really been saved, we are not going to be overtaken in the heirs of the world. But it's those that profess with their mouth but don't have Christ in their heart that are in this falling away. They made a profession, but they don't have any possession in their soul or salvation. They just talk the game. They walk like a Christian. They talk like a Christian for what gain it will give them in this life. But they've never truly been saved. That's the ones that's falling away. And listen, you can't, you can't live in that state and be right with God. You just cannot do it. He said that day shall not come except to come a falling away first. And this morning, we're living in a time of falling away. I didn't know that the whole message would be about that. I thought we'd get on a little bit farther, but I believe I'm going to close right there. I believe that's as far as the Lord would have us to go this morning. And we'll pick up uh, with the latter part of this on the first Sunday in November. We don't have service next Sunday on the fifth Sunday. Uh, but I know there'll be churches having uh, services, and Mount Gillard's going to Cage Cove to have service. And some of you may be making plans to do that, and that's all right. But I want you to understand something this morning. Those, those, those that you come in contact with, let me say it like this. Those that you come in contact with that profess to be Christians and then they talk about their lifestyle, you can't hate them. Don't hate them. You're not going to win anybody by hating them. you got to love them and show them the truth in the Word of God. That you can't do that. That that's not a life that's going to please the Lord. That's not a life that shows that Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is living in us. If we can sin and do any way without any type, without any type of chastisement from the Lord, then that's a good sign that we've never been saved. But because the Bible says this, the Bible says that the Lord chasteneth them that He loves. Now, I didn't quote that right, but that's what He said: He chastens them that He loves. And if he brings us and corrects us for things that we do wrong, that's a good sign, okay, that we've been saved. But if we can do anything we want to do without any correction, I'd get an altar and I'd check up right now. I really would. I said something last Sunday about people that aren't bothered by the things that they're doing. There may not be anything in their heart and in their soul to bother them. I'm glad today that there's something that corrects me when I do wrong. Listen, I'm no better than nobody else. The only thing that's made me saved is the Spirit of God that Christ, and, and my belief, accepting Christ as my Savior. Being saved and born again is the only difference between us that possess salvation and those that make a mere profession of salvation. We'll pick this up. But I want to. I really want to. I really want to drive home the point today. You need to get. We need to be right with God. We need to be right with God. We're living in a time of falling away. Now I know this is on Facebook, and there'll probably be people that that don't like it. There'll be some thumbs down. It'll be all right. Don't bother me. I don't ever look at that no way. I ain't looking for their approval. I'm looking for the Lord's approval. I want him to say, well done. 
I want him to be the one that says, well done. I want him to be the one that says, you preached what I wanted you to preach. Amen. Brother Donnie, if we'll do that, then the, Lord, then the Lord will say, well done. Are you right with God this morning? Do you know people that may have fallen away and you need to pray for them? Listen, God don't send a message like this out for us to ignore. God wants us to take it to heart and bring it home. And check our lives. Check our heart. And preacher, I don't really know if I can live. Get in the altar. You can, make, you can live the way God wants you to live, but you're going to have to put him first. As we stand all over the house, Brother Ronnie or Brother Lamar, who, whoever's got a verse of an invitation song, come on. Five twenty-four. <laughs>